Hello, everybody. Welcome this morning. My name is Angie Peacock. I'm a psychiatric drug withdrawal consultant and a healing coach. I like to bring you um, conversations that are important to me, people that I adore, like Megan. Today, we're going to talk about lifestyle intervention, getting your health back during and after withdrawal, nutrition, strength training, healing, all of it. So welcome, Megan. Can you say hello to our audience? Hello, everyone. Super happy to be here. Awesome. All right. So if you're watching right now and you're on YouTube, please hit subscribe, like whatever. If you're on our page, I'm so close to a thousand. Please just like our page. I know it's stupid, but this is how the world works now. Um, if you're on, if you follow Megan, she's Megan Alice, Megan dot Alice. Please just like our page. I know it's stupid, but this is how the world works now. Um, if you're on, if you follow Megan, she's Megan Alice. You have to close that, Megan. Just like our page. I know it's stupid, but this is how the world works now. Um, if was that, Megan? You have to close it. Close it. Close, close the Facebook. Close the Facebook. We're getting echo. Close it. Okay. There you go. Okay, there you go. <laughs> okay, sorry. A little bit of technical difficult. It's fine. It's fine. You gotta turn. You gotta close it. Okay. You got it. Oh. It's off. Or you mute it. Is it off? You got it. Yes, it's off. Okay. 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 So Megan, tell us, how did you come to taking psychiatric drugs? Like what was happening in your life? What was that whole process like? Yeah. So my story is pretty lengthy. I'll keep it as brief as possible, but basically uh, it all started at age nine and I was a super obsessive compulsive child. Um, And my parents had me in and out of therapists and we just couldn't, you know, figure it out. So they decided that the best option was putting me on medications. Um, I think every parent wants to do what's best for their child. Right. And, you know, that was the best option at the time. So we thought, so, uh, when I was put on those medications throughout the years, so I was on them for 17 and a half years. Um, but when I was placed on them, um, I started to basically just feel like a zombie, Um, I was exhausted all of the time. I was, I had this undying appetite. No food could ever fill me up. And I actually think we'll discuss this later, but that was kind of the beginning of my disordered eating and food addiction. Um, throughout the course of my life, I was placed on, you know, cocktails of medications for anxiety, depression, uh, ADD, ADHD, and, I was so lethargic and zombie-like from these medications that I would literally just take Adderall to, I need Adderall to fully function, to be able to actually stay awake. I probably couldn't make it throughout the day without wanting to take a nap. And so learning was very difficult for me. My brain was always in a fog. Um, I would like to say that I was friends with everyone in school. I was that happy-go-lucky girl. But inside, behind closed doors, like I was dying inside. Um, so that's that's where it kind of uh, like that was the journey with 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 prescriptions. And then age sixteen came, um, and I just felt dumb. I grew up feeling dumb because pharmaceutical drugs made my brain not function properly. And I, like I said, I grew up in a fog. And so this obviously affected my entire self-esteem. I was a chubby kid for many years. So those, those fat kid jokes, right. They stick with you for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. And so 16 is when I was introduced to the gym. And I thought to myself, well, if I do not have anything else to offer to the world, maybe I can at least be fit and pretty. So that's really where my addiction with fitness kind of started um, playing in. Um, I definitely had some, like I said, disordered eating going on at the time um, and food issues, but I didn't look at them at, as disordered, right? So age 20 came and I got pregnant. I was young, I was dumb, making bad decisions, but I knew in my heart what I needed to do, what felt right to me. And so I had my daughter during that period of time being pregnant. I ate Ben and Jerry's. I was shit. I felt shame the whole pregnancy. I basically hid in my bedroom the whole pregnancy. Um, And so when I, after I gave birth, 
I was 200 pounds after birth. So I went back to the gym into my, you know, addictive fitness habits, Mm -hmm. um, and got the weight off. So at that moment in time, I'm a mother, right? I'm still feeling all of, you know, anxious, depressed, all of the things. Um, and I needed to work to survive. So I moved away for a little while to the Boston area, did some nannying, um, age 25. This is where kind of life started to take a turn. I kind of had a quarter life crisis and I was so sick and tired of feeling sick and tired. I was tired of feeling like a zombie and anxious and just, I wanted to discover myself. I was like, you know what, Megan, you don't know yourself without these pharmaceutical drugs, right? Like they've been my whole life. I was prescribed them at age nine. Now I'm 25. And I'm like, maybe, maybe they're making everything worse. And so I had a friend who was like, who encouraged me to get off of these drugs. And like, I just thought this was life. Like I thought, you know, I was going to be a slave to big pharma for the rest of my life. And so he really encouraged me. He was like, Megan, just, you know, like these are going to cause a lot of issues in your life long term if you do not figure this out. And so I found this book called Anatomy of an Epidemic. Everybody says this book. Everybody. uh, Have you ever read it? (laughs) Of course. Oh, (laughs) gosh. Everybody says it. Yeah. So this was the game changer for me. And I remember, and I get emotional talking about it because this was like the aha moment of my life. One of them, I've had many, but that was one of them. And um, as I'm reading this book, I just, I was full of anger and sadness and just wanted to cry. And I I felt completely robbed. Like my life was robbed from me and everything I was dealing with and had been going through just all made perfect sense. So here I am angry. And I basically cold turkeyed. Oh my God. Which no don't do that. Ever, Nobody do that. Ever no. do. Nobody do that. No. I just no. I didn't know. And I ended up going into five years of psychiatric drug withdrawal. And it was a nightmare. And but at the same time, I had felt so robbed and heartbroken that I was determined to get my life back. I just wanted to kind of be like, you know what? To, to big pharma. That's how like, I felt. Yeah. I tell people know. sometimes you got to get angry about this. Like th- nobody's going to help you. It's painful. It's suffering, but like, you got to have some part of you that keeps you alive. And if that's anger, let it be, let it be the anger. Yeah. Like I, I always like to say, even till this day, like there is purpose in your pain and you have two options. You can sit and feel sorry for yourself, which we're all allowed to do that, but you can't stay there. You have to be able to pick up the pieces and say, okay, what can I build from this? Who can I help from this? Right. Right. So during that five years of psychiatric drug withdrawal, which was basically very similar to having a head injury, um, it was doomsday every single day. I basically would wake up every morning wanting to die. But during that time period, I, I still had to work. I still had to be a mother. Um, and I also, I went back to school. I became a personal trainer, got my certification, worked a little in that area for a while. And then I also pursued, pursued firefighting and became a full-time firefighter and an advanced emergency medical technician. Now, during that time of psychiatric drug withdrawal, my food addiction went completely out of control. Oh, wait, my- Megan, I have to stop you because you're being very humble. Your withdrawal yeah. was hell. Yeah. Withdrawals. Like how bad was it? Like when it was the worst? So I, I would, a lot of times it, it mentally, it was, um, debilitating. Like I didn't feel like me. I would look in front of the mirror and not even be like, not even recognize myself. I just remember so many times looking in the mirror and just being like, where did you go? And when are you coming back? Right. And so my father would say to me, Meg, like, this is going to pass. This is going to pass. And, you know, life is still happening, you know, Mm -hmm. and this is also an invisible injury. So it's like, you can look like fine and everything's fine um, when you're dying inside, but when you have a family to take care of and a child to take care of and bills to pay, like 
you don't have an option, you know? So as painful as it was, it also, I tried to let it liberate me and motivate me. And I would always say to myself, if you get through all of these struggles and these pains and these hardships, it's like your mission needs to become helping others rise from the ashes, right? Because if I can do it, if you can do it, you know, anyone can do it. And it's like, sometimes, especially when you are just like hanging on to dear life, you are seeking hope. You just want hope, you know? And I, I I try to, to be that for other people because Mm -hmm. I know how I needed that when, when I was there. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Okay. So you're, I love that you're saying what I, similar to what I felt like there's this voice that was saying something's wrong. You got to get off these meds. And then you had this enforcement on the outside telling you this, what, when you came out of that five years, like, what was that healing process? Like, how did you reclaim yourself? How did you reclaim your identity, your purpose? Like, what am I going to do now? Who am I after you've been medicated since you were nine? Yeah. So, okay. So during the psychiatric drug withdrawal, like I had, you know, moved back home to my parents' house because I knew (laughs) I thought it was going to be like six months of withdrawal. Like I didn't think it was going to be freaking a half a decade. (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. but you know, I remember like probably, I was probably like two years into psychiatric drug withdrawal. I had been, you know, pursuing fitness a little bit, but it still was not paying the bills. And I was like, okay, Mag, like you need to figure out what the hell you're doing. And so that's when I decided to pursue, um, firefighting because I was like, okay, I can, my my dad, uh, I grew up, you know, kind of in the fire department and the fire service. My my father was, um, is a fire chief. So it was just like, it made sense. I was physically Mm -hmm. fit. I knew I could help people, all of that. Um, so I started to go down that path. Um, and then, um, so as soon as I started my career, I would say like right before my career started, that's when I was feeling good. Like, I was like, you know what? I think I'm out of the worst of psychiatric drug withdrawal. I was starting to feel human and I was so excited. Like I was starting a new career. I'm like, okay, I made it out of the depths. Like yep, life is it. about to get really, really good. Yep. Um, and then uh, two months into my brand new fire career, I suffered a traumatic brain injury on the job and everything shattered. I lost my entire career uh, and basically had to rebuild everything. Again, a second time. A second time. Um, But during this time, it was just another like, okay, what? Like, I don't know if you're spiritual, whether or not, but I'm very spiritual. I am. I am. I have to be, I don't have a choice without my faith. I would not be where I am today. I know there is, you know, a higher power. I believe in Jesus Christ. Um, and I, when, when I have moments, I have to just get down on my knees and just be like, okay, what, What? like, what is going on? So it really forced me into launching my business, which is what I do now is, you know, brain, body, and beyond, you know, health coaching, lifestyle coaching, um, because I've always felt in my heart that my purpose is to help others. And I believe that God kind of threw all of these pain and struggles at me so I could overcome them and then teach others how to do the same. Amazing. I love that. So let's talk about the nitty gritty. Okay. When you come out of withdrawal, there's a certain point where you're like, okay, I need to work on my body or get my body back or get my strength back. I mean, there's people that lay lay in bed for years and they cannot like lift a can of soup. Like it's Mm bad. Um, And I I definitely felt that where I felt pretty crappy. (laughs) You were eating whatever you got to eat just to get through it. You're trying not to, you know, eat crap, but you do. And then you're like, okay, I think it's time to like, I'm feeling good enough that I can follow a recipe. I'm feeling good enough that I want to try to go to the gym. I want to tiptoe back into my life. What was that process? What would you, what would you recommend, I guess, to people kind of in that spot? Cause I have a lot of them, like they're coming out of the bad part and they're trying to get back into life. Totally. Okay. So I will say for me personally, my diet was also terrible during psychiatric drug withdrawal. That's when my eating disorder and my food addiction totally manifested. So Mm -hmm if I could do it completely differently now. So I really dialed into like went hardcore into my attrition, probably a few months actually before my, my head injury, because Mm -hmm. I knew that I needed to get my food addiction under control. However, if I could go back and I knew what I knew now, um, because I also understand like, you know, 
you're, you have days where you can survive. Can get out of bed. And I think, you know, when you're trying to survive and you feel like dying, you're going to seek something to make you feel good. Right. Which is probably food. So I would, if you are somebody who can barely get out of bed, both, and I know this is so, so hard to do when you literally feel like dying, but your nutrition, I cannot like tell you enough how important it is, right? Like it is nutrition is the building blocks to healing, to I healing. I a hundred thousand percent. So I always say, okay, there's some things we control, can control other things we cannot. What is one thing that I can control right now. And almost always that's going to be what you put inside of your mouth. You can choose what you decide to put in your mouth. And when you are already, you know, chronically inflamed and your body needs healing and restoring to do, if you're constantly feeding it highly palatable, highly palatable foods, processed foods, high Mm -hmm. sugar, you're adding more inflammation. You're adding more, you know, fire, fuel to that fire. And you want to put that fire out. So I would always start with nutrition number one. And then when it comes to exercise, okay, their nutrition is superior to exercise. Exercise is so important, obviously too, for, you know, you can get those endorphins flowing. However, not all of us who are going through psychiatric drug withdrawal are you know, able to do that. So I always say, start super, super small. Okay. If you can even come up with five minutes to just go for a walk, like go for a walk. If maybe you're literally bedridden and you can't even get out of bed, do a few leg lifts. Maybe that exactly. looks like I always leg- tell people just put your arms above your head and just go like this a couple times. Yeah. Just a little and bit, tiny, tiny, yes. tiny. Yeah. I also too, like, you know, when you're feeling basically handicapped, I love having writing a piece of paper down and you can put, um, you know, goals for the day or win the day, right? Give yourself three to five things that you legitimately can achieve. And maybe one of those things is listen to something positive for 10 minutes, you know, or drink 20 ounces of water, you know, Yes, like water, simple things. And also when you get to check those, those, that list off, it also helps build your confidence, right? So, because when you are going through psychiatric drug withdrawal, you have been completely stripped of everything. everything. And that also takes your confidence away from you. You, you feel worthless. You feel useless. you you probably feel a burden on, on a lot of your family members. Um, and it's extremely isolating. So if you can kind of build, build a little confidence back in yourself by like, okay, I'm going to give myself three to five things a day. And maybe those things are little, little baby things, but who cares? Right. And you slowly build off of that. Yeah. I love that. I love that. All right. So let's go talk a little bit more about food. I know there's people in the community that say you can eat whatever you want and you'll still heal. Yeah, that might be true, but I agree with you. I heard this quote from, um, what is his name? Sean Stevenson. You know him, right? I forgot. He's a podcaster. He's so good. Oh my God. He says every single ounce of food you put in your mouth is building every cell in your body. So choose wisely. And I, I could not, I'm telling you the first year off, I ate peanut butter, dark chocolate kind bars, uh, chicken soup in a can, oranges, bananas, and these little smoothies from Trader Joe's. That's all I could eat because any food in my mouth was like the texture sent my brain into panic. So that was my first year. At 11 months off, I was in the film, Medicating Normal, and they were filming me and they said, Angie, we want you to do Kelly Brogan's protocol. And at the time back then, she was really into like ancestral, primal, paleo, women need a little bit of carbs around their period. No, no drink except filtered water. I did that. And I'm not kidding you. Like I think 11 symptoms went away. I I got my first night of four hours of sleep and I was like, holy crap. And that was just, I mean, I wasn't eating that bad. It was just like a little bit of tweaking, you know? Um, so I noticed immediately that changed. So what do you think about diet? Like which one's the best, which one, and this is a controversial question and we might not agree. It's fine. But like, how does a person figure out what is the best food that they should eat or what can, you know what I'm saying? Like, where do I start? Where do I start? So I always like to say you, uh, you got to look at yourself as your biggest experiment, right? 
And that means trial and error. However, you actually have to give something time. And that means trying more than two weeks. Okay. So, you know, for me personally, I think eating a, a, a lower carb, low inflammatory diet, um, for me personally, that's what works. Um, I do know that, you know, meat, whether people want to believe it or not, is one of the most nutrient dense foods that you can possibly eat. It's also one of the most bioavailable foods you can eat as well. Um, so it also, in terms of mental health, you also want a nice, um, stable blood sugar, right. And going low carb, higher fat that, that helps with that. You also, you know, you, you aren't just what you eat, but you are what you absorb and food is, uh, uh, information to the body. Right. And gut health, right? Like think of your gut as your second brain, it's connected, right? So if you have terrible things growing inside of your gut and your microbiome, like it's your mental health is probably going to be even poorer. Um, so for me personally, I'm a huge advocate of low carb, higher fat, not to mention, right? Like whether we like to say so or, or not, when you're going through psychiatric drug withdrawal, that's, you know, very similar to a brain injury. It's a hit to your nervous system, right? So healing the brain is going to ask for more higher fat foods. Also, if, you know, and this is also, you know, not to talk ketogenic, because I know a lot of people are like, oh my God, ketogenic, but sometimes getting into a ketogenic state, and I also use this as a healing modality, is ketones can be extremely healing to, to the brain. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that for me personally, that's what I coach low carb, high fat. Um, I don't like to call it ketogenic because one, a lot of people aren't even educated on what that actually means yeah. and they, they, they panic right away. They hear it. So to put it really, it's really eating real foods Food. from the earth. Shocking. What do you yeah. mean, and, Megan? <laughs> and, higher, and, and it's more higher fat and fat has been demonized like oh my god saturated fat it's going to give you a heart attack if you no. are eating high fat with a high carb diet that's where you're going to have problems but when you're eating a high fat diet in the absence of carbohydrates that's a totally different story yeah yeah and i did same as you i did keto for 18 months and honest to god looking back you know it's been like a year since i stopped but looking back i see i had these weird like seizure like episodes where my nose would get like really chemically and I would get like tunnel vision and I have this feeling of doom. It would come over me and it's like, Angie, sit down. You're going about to pass out or you're going to have a seizure or something. And all those episodes stopped when I switched. And since then I've done a lot of research about um, keto and they say that intermittent fasting ketosis can help that glutamate GABA transfer quicker than just a normal diet. So I was like, Hmm, babe, I bet you that's what I was doing. And I didn't yeah, they realize use it. it. They use it to treat epilepsy. I know. And those symptoms never came back. Also my, I had nystagmus in the middle of the night that didn't come back after exactly. I switched. So I'm a huge fan. I mean, now if, if I'm being honest, how do I eat now? I'm gluten-free actually I ate gluten two days ago. And now I have hives from stress and probably some of that gluten, but, um, that's how I eat. And I had to do all different kinds. I did zone. I did paleo. I did I can't do carnivore. I try. I just couldn't do it. I'm just like a texture person, but paleo, ancestral, primal, I did all the different versions and I feel my best on low carb, high fat, paleo ish. That's it. I can't do the grains. The That's just what I found. And like you said, I experimented for years, like try this, try that. How do I feel when I eat sweet potatoes? How do I feel when I eat rice? Man, a big bowl of rice with grass fed butter on it. That's my like treat, you know, but that's like around my period. I don't do that every day. Right. You know? Um, all right. So let's talk about strength training and exercise. So let me share my experience with exercise because I tried, and I say this to my clients all the time. Like you have to do like little tiny exposure or little tiny, I call them touchstones. Like if you walk around the block, how do you feel? If you walk to the mailbox, how do you feel? And maybe on Thursday, you're going to feel like crap on Saturday. You might feel a little better. And maybe on Sunday you do it again. And your body says, no, you're not ready for that. It's fine. Back off you know, and then you try a couple months later and that's kind of how I had to do it. I can't hear you, Angela. 
<laughs> I had sense my headphones are really panicky and I got to oh. get better. Ones. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I yeah. can hear you. Okay, okay, sorry. Okay, so I, I encourage little touchstones. Like when you're in akathisia, when you're in the acute phase, you cannot do any of this. I'm not telling you to push it. I'm not telling you to do it. When you feel like, okay, I think I might have an impulse that's telling me to walk outside. That's when you follow that. You follow the impulse. Later, I did little touchstones. Okay, let me try to lift a couple weights and see what happens. Or let me try to ride my bike and see what happens. And then it would be like, nope, you're not ready. And I have to back off. So I'm not kidding you when I say it took me until about six years off before I could consistently go to the gym and tolerate exercise and not feel worse. That is a very long time. And I'm not saying that to scare anyone. I was an extreme case. Yours could be two years. Yours could be three years, whatever. Um, now... I have this sense of vitality that came back that said, it is time. You have to exercise. It's not even an option anymore. Like every day I have to do that. So tell me about your like healing process with exercise and how did that go? Yeah. So for me, um, so it's very different uh, now versus during psychiatric drug withdrawal. So believe it or not, during psychiatric drug withdrawal, fitness was my escape. Um, like I was... I was working out hardcore. Like that was like during my crazy crossfitting days, which mm -hmm. I'm not I had those two. I had them anymore. Too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I actually looking back, so like it would definitely flare up my symptoms like so bad. Like I would, I would feel fine during the workout, but after the workout, I would literally get um um like rage and super like anxious, like crawling out of my skin, like, Thanks. and, uh, and even my mother would say, Megan, like, you know, it's just making your symptoms worse. And I'm like, no, it's not. Cause I like needed that outlet. That was the only time that I felt peace was like in this vigorous exercise, because you don't have any, mm -hmm. anything else that you can think about. You just have to put all of your focus and energy there. And I think that's why I was so good at it. Yeah. But, um, so now, now, um, after my head injury, um, literally I could barely, which is very similar to psychiatric drug withdrawal because it's, you know, a, a hit to your nervous system. Right. So I suffered with really, really bad exercise intolerance, uh, nervous system dysregulation, like so bad. And that happened four years ago and I'm still not back to normal. Mm -hmm. Uh, so for anyone who is in a situation now where it's like, holy cow, like I cannot work out. I think the best thing you can do for yourself is slowly, very similar to what you said, slowly start exposing yourself little by little, like, um, right after my, my head injury, I could barely do a, an air squat without getting sick and wanting to throw up everywhere. Um, so basically like when I say start super, super small, maybe that means you're starting with 10 air squats a day. You know, Wait, let me show them. I'll be demonstrating for people to see what an air squat is. <laughs> Here we go. Ready? You just put your legs next to, you know, shoulder width apart and you just sit down and you stand back up. That's it. That's an air squat. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> there you go. Perfect. There you go. <laughs> That would be where you start. All right. Um, so and, what is and walking? Literally, walking, I know this sounds walking so is... walking is huge because it's also very like relaxing, you know, like your body is when you're going through this, your body is in a state of fight or flight and trying to learn how to calm your nervous system down is easier said than done. But walking is very, is another really useful tool for that. I agree. I agree. Um, so I guess where we're coming is the pinnacle. When you come out of psychiatric drug withdrawal and you realize I can't take these meds anymore. I still have life. I have to manage stress. I need to have good sleep. I have to look at my life completely holistically and rethink everything that I thought I knew about my life. And I got to figure out a way to live like this now. How do you view that? Yeah. Uh, start with one thing. Start with one thing. Uh, I think it can get extremely, extremely overwhelming when you are like, oh my gosh, like I'm starting from square one, but instead of feeling sad, which you are very, a lot, you were allowed to feel, I want, I always like to tell people like, get excited, like get excited. We are given one life 
and that's it. And it goes by so quick. And you need to look at this life as like, it truly is a gift. Like we are so lucky and blessed to have this opportunity at life. And sometimes life can suck. Sometimes it can, and it can get really, really hard, but instead of drowning in this pain and sorrow, and, and I'm all about feeling it, feel it because that is part of the healing process, but get excited because you have the ability to turn your life into whatever you want it to be. And your pain can potentially save someone else's life. And just know that it's like, it does not, your life does not have to be doom and gloom for the rest of your life. Like, like I said, we, we have, we have a choice. We have a choice. We can sit in the pain and the grief, or we can pick up the pieces and create something brand new, something completely, you know, different. And like, you can appreciate, you know, who you were, but now you're going to appreciate who you're, who you're becoming. I love that. And start, start with one thing, one thing. So like, maybe that's, you know, I, I know my nutrition sucks right now. So I'm going to just start with the food piece. Right. And then the cool part is once you start like eating better, you're probably going to start better better. when you're feeling better. You're like, okay, maybe I'll, you know, start going on like a walk every single day and slowly build. And it's like so, so many of the times we look so far ahead and do I think looking ahead and planning is important? Absolutely. But sometimes when we're in a terrible mindset, because we're sick, looking so far down the road can be just like, oh my gosh. So I always like to say, you just have to take it one day at a time. And one of the things that I, I'm not going to lie, sometimes I slack, but what keeps me staying positive during hard times, because let's be real, hard times are, are part of life is finding either an audiobook, a podcast or um or or an audible that is personal development based something positive that is going to like lift your spirits up 10 to 20 minutes a day of that i am telling you it works changing wonders yeah. it's life changing and i know mm-hmm. like cuz there'll be weeks where i slack and i'll be and i'll i'll get into a funk and i'll be like meg put on a podcast and it does, it it gets your, your head right. And, um, instead of staying in a negative mindset, you know, always choose positivity, always choose optimism because it's, it's going to help you. Yeah. I call it more like a, cause people can get really rubbed wrong when they, when you say like, just think, just think positive. You're going to be fine. Pull your bootstraps up. Like this is temporary. You know, some of that stuff is not helpful when you're in withdrawal. You're like, are you kidding? My entire body's burning and it's on fire. And you're telling me to think positive. I don't think so. But I think of it like healing mindset, like healing is certain. It's just a matter of time. It's going to turn off any minute and you are going to rebuild your life. And this is going to be a chapter behind you that you don't have to ever think about or write a success story about, or you will just move on and go away. Like that's, that is the, the reality of the situation. That's not positive thinking. That's the reality. You have the opportunity to rebuild your life. That's reality. Yeah. And s- some people build this big, magnificent life. Some people, it's just like, I'm not going to work in corporate America anymore. I'm going to drive Uber and I'm going to be happy. And that's it. And that's yeah. fine. And happiness can look different for every single in- individual. Yeah. And yeah. I, I do too. I think too, it's like what you just said. It's like, I forget what you just said, but it was about building, but basically like your pain, look at your pain when you were in the midst of hell, right. And you don't understand why this is happening to you. Just know that it's building you for something bigger. Even if you don't understand it right now, you, I promise you, you will understand eventually why this had, why you had to go through this. Yeah. I I think, um, I think a lot of people put pressure on themselves. I'm thinking of one person right now and I know she's watching. Like, how am I going to make money? How am I going to rebuild my life? How, how, how? It's like, you don't even have to know how. Like, you just stay alive. Let the process unfold. I'm serious. Like, even me, I used to think when I was on meds, I used to think, oh, I watched all these self-help. I I think I read like 300 books trying to figure out what was wrong with me. And I didn't know it was the meds. And I was like, 
all these people telling me all this stuff, like you can have this great life and you can do this and you can do that. I'm like, I don't understand how these people do this. And I always felt different because I could not quite get there. And now I look back and like the meds were keeping me from getting there. First of all, yes. second of all, it is true. It's not BS that you can build a life, whatever you want it to be. Literally. That is exactly yeah, what like, I've look done. At, look at your life right now, right? Exactly. Like your life is so badass. And I bet you that when you were going through psychiatric drug withdrawal, you never would imagine in a million years nope. you driving around in a sick RV traveling the freaking country. Nope. Never. Nope. And it took courage and I was terrified and I was still very symptomatic. And I, I have a really good friend with Joel. She's eight years off too. And I literally, she was my first stop. And I drove from St. Louis to Tulsa and I had a panic attack the entire way full of terror because there was no exits on the highway in Oklahoma. And I was like, how does a highway not have exits? I need a place to get out of here. And I just had to keep driving. And then when I got to the first exit that I found off the turnpike in Oklahoma, I pulled over, I parked in the parking lot. I called her. I said, I can't drive one more mile. I said, I'm freaking out. Do you think they're going to call the cops on me? I'm at the gas station. She's like, no, you're at a gas station. Nobody's going to call the cops on you. And I said, well, I can't go anywhere. I have to lay here until I feel better. There's no way. I mean, that was my first day. I cried the whole day, you know? And then the first month it was like, okay, I can do this. I think. And then it was yeah. like a year. It took me like a year to get my feet under me where I could actually leave the van. I couldn't hardly leave the van, you know? And now it's four years. I've been on the road four years and I'm like, I have all these friends that don't know anything about withdrawal. I don't share that with them. I have a great time. I'm dancing and staying up late and yeah, but that's how it did. It starts very small, very slowly. You don't have to really know how to do it or what to do. It's Can just I like um, elaborate on your anxiety sure. piece? Yes, please. Because I resonate that with that. So, you know, when I was on pharmaceuticals uh, and going through psychiatric drug withdrawal, my anxiety was literally so bad. It was completely debilitating, right? Uh, my anxiety literally ran my freaking life. And Megan was just kind of like in the background, like hanging on, like I knew the life that I wanted, but I just, anxiety was running the show. And so when I was going through psychiatric drug withdrawal and uh, actually before, right before I decided to pursue firefighting, I was like, you know what, from here on out, if it scares the shit out of me, no matter how anxious it makes me feel, because like, I know anxiety, man, like, like oh, wanting yeah. to throw up anxiety. Right. Yeah. So we know that anxiety is fear, right? So I encourage you, if you are struggling with anxiety and I know this is easier said than done, but I've done it. So you can too, is you challenge that anxiety. You challenge that fear and you tell yourself, you tell that voice of sabotage, like, no, I got this. I can do I'm this. Going. I am going and you are not holding me back because at the end of the day, literally, what is the worst thing that's going to happen to you? Exactly. We're all going, we're all going to die. So every anxiety, <laughs> every fear, challenge it, challenge it. And I promise you with time, if you keep doing that, you're not going to exactly. be afraid of anything. That's exactly what I did. I'm still doing it. Yes, but even, me too. <laughs> even, but I think the thing for me that I still have lingering, it's scary for me to share this, but it's like when I provoke any of that fear response, like when my brain goes into fight or flight, it feels different than it used to. And I'm still kind of working with it. Like, okay, we're going to go stand at the ledge. I have a TikTok right now that if anybody wants to watch it, maybe Jill can put it in the comments, but it was about me trying to challenge like the fear and stepping closer. And I calm myself and like, it's okay. You're fine. You're safe. And I step closer and step closer, but that's exactly what I did. I'm like, you're scared and you're doing it anyway. And your brain is misinterpreting things and you're doing it anyway. And do you know how many times I've walked in the grocery store and I thought I am going to freaking die and hit my head and they're going to call the ambulance. I'm going to have to take Ativan and then I'm going to have to hurt you know, the word I'm going to have to do that thing that we're all scared of because that's how bad I feel. And that never happened. It was lying to me the whole time. My brain was mis sending off danger signals. And the more I did that, and the more I said, Angie, you've never passed out in the grocery store. That's never happened. All these times that you thought you were gonna, and here you are, you're still alive. And now I can walk in a grocery store and I don't even think about it, you know, but that's how it is. It's like our brain is lying to us because we're so injured 
And yeah. I'm not, again, I'm trying to be delicate. Like I could not do that some days. Like it was literally like I dropped my groceries and run out crying there. I was telling my friend the other day, I tried to go to the post office. It took me three times. I could not get my mail from the post office. I had to call another survivor in the same city and say, can you come up here and get my mail? Cause I can literally cannot walk in the post. And that was like five years off. I could you not just get afraid to go no, into my brain office. was like, it was way overstimulated. My resilience was low. My ability to handle it. It was just like some days I could do it. And some days I could not. And yeah. I just had to, I had to go with the flow with all of it and not, not take it as like a hard and fast rule. Like maybe I can't do it on Tuesday, but on Thursday, I'm going to try again. Yeah. And some days I pulled the cord and I sat in the car and I was like, can't do it right now. And I'd wait like half an hour. I try again. I was fine. Just kept working with it and just slowly, you know, and some people have accused me like, well, maybe that's why you're protracted because you pushed too hard. I don't know. I would have feeling like shit either way. <laughs> well, that's you know? exactly true. It's like, you know what? It's like, you have to outweigh the pros and cons. And like, sometimes that means testing the waters and sometimes it totally backfires. And sometimes, yeah. you're like, oh. Okay. So I got this. But like when it comes to like anxiety and fear too, I always like kind of like make this picture inside of my head. And it's like before every like hard decision. And I will say every hard decision I've ever made has always ended up being the best decision, one. but it's, but it's always the scariest, you yeah. know? And so it's like, think of like a cliff, right. And on the count of three, you're just gonna, you're gonna go, you're gonna That's sit, it. right. That's you, it. You, and you jump, you're going to learn how to fly. Exactly. Oh my God. I totally agree with you. Like even just this van, when I bought it, I was like, Angie, this is the stupidest thing you've ever done. This is way too much money. You have no Are furniture. you kidding me? I'm yeah. like watching God, you. I'm terrified. like living my dream right now. Like it's terrified. Awesome. Terrified. And I was like, I don't even know if I can pay the bill. Um, we're just gonna see what happens. And it all completely worked out. Same yeah. thing. It was like you just gotta do it. Even like in my relationships, like making friends. I'm like, I had to relearn all that. And now I'm like, uh, Hey, do you want to hang out? I'm terrified. I don't know what they're going to say. They could reject me. I'm just going to take a chance. Like, so that's kind of, I love that we're talking about this. Just let, how's your relationship to fear and anxiety change? Because you don't have, I can't take an out van and go talk to people or get on an airplane. No, you got to like, uh -huh. huh? No, uh -uh. Yeah, no, me neither. no, no, no. Okay. That's off limits. Okay. Yeah. But what else are you passionate about? Like what, what is, what's been happening lately? I know, I think you've taught, I watch you on Instagram and I watch your reels and I watch your cute videos and like, they pump me up. I love them. So I know recently you were talking about SIRS. Can you touch on that really quick? Oh yes. That's another little bump in the road. So, uh, it's funny you say what I'm, what I'm, what am I passionate about right, right now? Anything that is health related, because you, when you have been sick or injured so many times nice. health becomes literally an obsession because all you want is to feel good. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and you know, Western medicine, uh, has done nothing but hurt me. So it's like, okay, I've kind of put my health in my own hands and, you know, seeking, you know, more holistic approaches. Cause those are the things that help me personally. Um, so sirs, um, so, uh, I had opened up after, um, my head injury in the fire service, I launched my online business, but I also had a great opportunity to open up my own gym, which I did. I poured my heart and soul into it. Um, it was my little baby for a very short time. And during the year that I was there, I started to get really sick. I'm like, what's going on? Not again. And so I was like, I was losing so much hair. I was losing so much hair. Like I felt like I was losing a piece of my womanhood. It was so bad. I started, I was wearing wigs last winter because my hair was, it's finally like coming back. Um, but yeah, it was so thin. I, my fatigue was like chronic. I could barely get out of bed. And because I'm kind of a geek, um, I was like, I was like, I'm showing like all of the signs of mold illness. And I think I was in denial for quite some time because it's not cheap to take care of at all. Um, so I found out that I had SIRS, which is chronic inflammatory response syndrome. So basically one in four people in the United States have a genetic type that does not properly detox the biotoxins that mold gives off. Mold is literally everywhere. It's more than 50% of the buildings in the United States. Ugh. 
So I have to be right now. I have to, because my immune system hates me right now and it's like under attack. So I have to be a super psycho with basically everywhere I go. So long story short, uh, all last year I lost my condo, my car and my business, um, to mold, like mold was chasing me everywhere. I found it in my condo and my condo was brand spanking new. Um, it was in my sunroof. I had a panoramic sunroof. It was in there. Um, and then in my studio, my gym, I was getting lots of water damage in the ceiling. And I was like, literally like I had already lost a car and a condo. And I'm like, no, not my, not my studio. And it was trapped, uh, in the ceiling and, uh, yeah. Oh behind the ceiling. Now nightmare. the typical person that doesn't have now mold is not healthy really for everybody, anyone, but if you're somebody who has a genetic type like me, that doesn't properly mm-hmm. detox, uh, these biotoxins, you can get really, really sick. And a lot of people will think like it's frou-frou and like, oh my gosh, like yeah. dude, I've got labs. I have blood work to show it. Um, so I will, this was also a learning curve for me too, because, you know, Food can heal a lot. Food is medicine, but it cannot heal everything. Like right now I'm on a lengthy protocol to basically rid the biotoxins out of my body. Um, but you know, there's a lot of environmental illnesses, um, that can play in a part to your, to your health as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So true. Okay. I think I'm going to ask you one more question and then we'll start our ending. But I would say like, what is your life like now? What is a good life built when you do take control and you look at all these aspects of your health and you take your health back into your own hands and you stop giving it to like Western medicine and listening to doctors. And I went to a doctor office yesterday and I was like, so anxious. I could barely sit in there. It It was with another survivor. She needed me to advocate for her. And I was like, I can't even sit in here. Like, it's just, ugh. so, I mean, what is it like? What is it like when you really take control of every part of your life and do as best as you can. I'm not going to say we're ever going to be perfect, but what can that look like? Uh, it can look messy, (laughs) but honest, but it can also look beautiful. Like, you know, no matter what life is never going to be perfect ever. And you're going to have years that are going to be amazing. And then you're going to have years that are going to be like, Oh my God, like what a shit show this has been. But if you live a life that is true to you and your heart and your beliefs, regardless of what anyone else says, then that to me is a beautiful life. Doing what is um, hard and not what's necessarily easy, Um, you know, creating a life that you're proud of. Like last night, for instance, I was going to bed with my daughter and, you know, like this last year, so I'm not going to lie. It's been really stressful, but I was going to bed last night. And sometimes like, I'm very bad at shutting my brain off. Like I'm always like eh, thinking mm-hmm. all of the times, but I was like, you know what? Like I am, I think sometimes we get so caught up in the everyday grind that we forget how lucky we are. Right. And I was just thinking to myself, you know, all of these bad things happened to me. I truly believe because it forced me and pushed me into my true purpose, which is helping humans live better lives. And as I was going to bed last night, I was like, you know what? Like I, I am lucky. Like I get to wake up every single, single day of my life doing what I love, doing what I love and what brings me like true joy is knowing that I'm helping others change their lives too. Like that's, I think a lot of people, not everybody ever gets to a place where they know their true purpose, right? And in terms of mental health, I think that's a a missing piece for people. It's so important for people to know what their purpose is because if we don't have purpose, then what are we even doing here, right? Like it can feel empty. So um, if you are going through psychiatric drug withdrawal right now, it's like, just keep hanging on and know that the healing process is not linear at all. It's going to be winding roads. But what stuck with me during my journey was knowing that, you know what, you do heal, do what you can, do what you have control over to help with that healing process and never lose hope. Like you have got to cling to hope 
so much and believe that you are going to get better. And I promise you will. That was excellent. You answered two questions in one. <laughs> that was excellent. Uh, but maybe I'll add to it in a second. Um, but I do, I do, I mean, I just love your message. We've come to the same kind of things that I have, which is validating for me. <laughs> but it's almost like, in a sense, we don't really have a choice. You have to get healthy. You have to. Um, mm-hmm. You have to think about all these different parts of your life and like, how am I going to be different? Or how am I going to prevent that set of circumstances that led up to this whole situation not happen again? Like, how do I feel better in my own body with all these symptoms that I have? You know, I've had to study my symptoms, study what am I eating? Is there something in my environment? Like, what can I do better? And some days I can't do investigator. Nothing. You're basically an investigator of, of yourself. Yeah. yeah. Of yourself. Instead of giving yourself over and letting them investigate, you are doing the investigation, you know? Yeah. Um, but I, yeah, in a sense, I just feel like I haven't really had a choice. Like I have to do all these things. And like I said, there's been, there's been times I talked about this a lot this week for, with a group that I run about like this constant need to find something to heal. Like let's do all the things and I want to do everything. And there was times I did that. And then there was times like Angie, stop, like, don't do anything. Just stop and see what's there. How do you feel? Like Less what? sometimes more. Yeah. And then sometimes I was like, wait, maybe I don't need to do intensive trauma therapy because I actually feel pretty good in that aspect. Like I'm okay over here, but maybe I need to shift focus to spirituality and read a little bit more things to get some good thoughts in there. Cause I, I'm not naturally that way because of the trauma I've been through, you know, but um, anyway, so I just, yeah, we're on the same, we're both doing the same thing. It's very interesting. I like it. I like it. Yeah. And just, I want to add in one more thing too. It's like, just know that like, nobody has to understand what you're doing or has to understand your journey, do what feels right for you. Because no matter what, we're not going to make everybody happy. Somebody's always going to be judging you probably because people, some people suck. So what would do what feels right to you. And, you know, if you feel like, you know, so like social media, for instance, it's like, for me personally, I don't scroll through social media. There's too much noise. It's just too much. If it's, if it's not negative, if it's not positive, I don't want it in my life. So just, you know, focus on you and your only and and your, and your journey. And yeah. I love that. All right. So last thing, and I, you kind of already said it, but just any closing words of hope, can you offer anybody hope that's watching that's in the midst of withdrawal that has akathisia that, is terrified that doesn't believe in healing. What would you say to them if they're watching? You have to believe in healing, believe in healing. And even though you may, you know, feel like dying right now, you know, you have to cling to hope and, and I know it's easier said than done, but it's like, ask yourself, okay, like, what is something that I could maybe do right now to get my head in a better place? Because I know how difficult that is. Like when you feel like death, like, like you said, like, oh, be positive. Like it's not that easy. So put on, put on an audible, find a podcast, talk to a friend. Like if you have a good friend or family or support system, sometimes just communicating with someone, telling somebody, Hey, like, I feel like crap right now. Just talking through your emotions. Know that also know that you are not crazy because I think a lot of people too, right? They, they want so badly to get off of these medications. And now when they're going through psych withdrawal, they start to be like, oh my God, I am crazy. Maybe I need these, but it's not you. It's what your body's going through right now to heal and recover. So know that the pain and suffering that you are in right now, that it will pass you know, take it one day at a time and, and look at your, your pain is, is building you, uh, into a better human and there's going to be purpose for it. I love that. Great message to end on. All right. Well, Megan, if somebody wants to follow you or get a hold of you or get coached by you, how would they find you? Yep. So I am most active right now on my Instagram. You can find me um, at Megan Alice, M E G H A N N dot Alice. So yeah, shoot me a DM. Um, but yeah, that's where, you, where you'll find me. Perfect. And the, her captions, if you look below this video, her captions have all the website and everything in it. So please follow her and 
for hope and inspiration and health tips and nutrition tips. And I like watching you. So you inspire me. Thank you. (laughs) All right. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. Um, Next Saturday, actually, we're going to have Dan Landauer, who is Philosophical Fishing on um, YouTube and in TikTok. He's also a survivor. So we'll talk to him. Megan, thank you. Thank you for all you do. Thank you for surviving. Thank you for keep getting back up after you keep getting kicked in the teeth. I know that's hard. I do. I know it. I know it. But keep on being a badass like you are. Thank you. You too. All right. Good night or good night. Goodbye, everybody. We'll see you later. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.